Hello and welcome to another episode of the Interwoven Podcast. I'm Adam Roxby, the Director of Communications here at The Weave. And in this episode, our Director of Business Development, James Cracknell, had the opportunity to talk to Paul Wingerhutz about the changing landscape of recruitment. So without delay, let's listen to that conversation and gain some further insight into recruitment. I'm absolutely delighted today to be talking to uh, Paul Wingerhutz. He's somebody that I've kind of known for a number of um, years. Paul is a, a distinguished IT and technology recruiter. Um, he's, I think, got at least two decades worth of extensive experience within that industry and has a passion for sort of connecting with people and making things happen. His business, which is Holland Resources, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome uh, Paul to the conversation. And we're just going to sort of explore a little bit about his background, where he's come from, some of the experiences he's had, and um, maybe look to the future a little bit. So welcome, Paul. Thank you very much for joining us. Brilliant. Great. It's nice to be here. And, you know, the same. Obviously, you and I have known each other um, loosely for what seems like, you know, a number of years now. But, um, yeah, it's just nice to sit down and have a conversation with you. Yes. Yeah, so thanks very much for inviting me on. No problem at all. Um, right, we can start just by kind of reflecting a little bit maybe on some of the things in your career and your journey that have got you to this particular space. So what do you feel that over the last two to three years of working in this particular area, it's very different potentially from what life was like when you first started out in the recruitment space. Recruitment it really sort of goes in two two main ways, which is one is a sort of a, a candidate led market, and then one's a client led market, really, which is all to do with supply and demand. Um, I think the biggest shift that I've seen recently, which is really post pandemic, is the shift in. Um, hybrid working remote working that's changed the landscape a lot so previous to that i would say nearly all of the clients if not all of the clients i worked with would have people in the office five days a week so a big part of our work was really building up networks of candidates locally you you know people that could commute um into the you know into the relevant office so i think the biggest thing for me really has been although my main focus is still quite regional within the east of england a big part of what's changed for me is now speaking to clients and candidates, you know, right across the UK. Um, and there's different nuances for that. Um, different regions have, you know, slightly different sort of skill sectors, different ways of recruiting, um, you know, different wage disparities as well for different areas. So I think it's really just adjusting to working with and talking to people from, you know, right across the UK. The world of work is, as we know, is a changing dynamic. And I think it's kind of interesting, particularly when you're dealing with the world of potentially IT, which ultimately can be quite um, sort of focused around the individual rather than sort of kind of large teams or whatever. So, but I, I do think that they, that there's a generational switch between the way people are looking for jobs and what they're looking for out of a job and things like that. Or, or do you feel that underlyingly there is a consistency? Uh, no, I, I think there has been a big shift, definitely, with the sort of younger generation. Before, people wanted to go and work for big corporates, you know, get the, the benefits, the salary, a job for life type thing. As where I think now the biggest shift, I think, is two things. The first shift, I think, is an, an entrepreneurial outset. There's, there's far more entrepreneurs than there's ever been before. And that doesn't necessarily mean that people want to start their own business you know but it means people are more entrepreneur in their approach to work and the way they want to work as opposed to working for organizations that you know dictate to them you have to do this 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 and this and this you know be in at this time work with these hours type things they want a more of a sort of autonomous entrepreneurial approach which is having freedom to be able to kind of work in a way they want to work have a lot of input on the way things are done um but also as well, there has been a huge shift, and this is a very not quite sure of the, the the age bracket, but the younger generation that have been coming through that want to do something to create the world, uh, to make the world a better place. So, you know, for good causes, you know, I had a chap recently that had worked for BT for 12 years, big, you know, obviously huge corporate, um, started there as a trainee, worked there for 12 years, 
Um, just I wouldn't necessarily say woke up one day and had an epiphany, but over time he realised that he wanted to do something better with the work that he was doing. So he took voluntary redundancy and was looking for a job that, you know, offered him the opportunity to work for an organisation that um, was making the world a better place. I managed to get him a job. It was the, the perfect fit at the right time for a green tech company. So these people are, they work in solar power. So for him, you know, it was the perfect role with the perfect mission from a business perspective as well. So that's the, one of the biggest shifts as well. People are more um, consciously aware of the type of work that they're doing. So again, you know, the opposite of that, I see people moving away from gambling companies, tobacco companies or alcohol companies. So the opposite, you know, is also true. You know, not necessarily that people want to drive towards this. I've got to work for a company that are doing great things, but sometimes it's just they don't want to work for companies that maybe aren't doing great things as well. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's so. interesting, isn't it? I think that ethics of managing your career and aspirations around your, your own core values and your own areas of belief. I mean, we see a lot of it in terms of the way entrepreneurship is developing and we're kind of moving away from the two hats of social entrepreneurship and traditional entrepreneurship into, well, actually, you know, as a business, we need to be doing good. We need to be thinking about things in a different way because our customers, as much as anything else, are doing that. And the likes of our staff and our talent pool are also working in that particular way. And I think that that's that's quite an interesting area and dynamic. So in terms of your practices, then, in ter- when you're looking for working with recruit or, or companies for a recruitment project, do you think that they naturally start recognizing maybe this new incentive and are they modifying their value? you their proposition they're putting to their candidates to be more reflective of that yeah i think some of them naturally do that anyway but also as well i think some of them have realized they have to do it to be competitive because it is at the moment and it has been for quite a while you know it is a candidate-led market there is in certain fields somewhat of a talent shortage from a you know technical particularly a software developer uh, perspective and i think that you know in order to attract the, uh, and retain the best talent because i think retention is a big thing as well so it's all very well attracted attracting but it's the retention of those talents as well um you know they're realizing that they have to adapt and be flexible and offer the things that matter to people before and again a big shift really probably over the last 10 years is before a lot of recruitment was when i speak to people was all about salary as a while one the biggest salary the most amount of money but again people aren't as money motivated now you know, obviously a big part of my job is having these conversations with candidates very much now you know people will say things like i just need enough money to cover my bills and give me a little bit of extra or you know i'm not motivated by money as long as i've got enough to survive you know so again the big shift there because you know what they're looking for then is more of a work-life balance as well it's what i call the softer benefits you know so it's having flexibility to you know drop your kids off at school or put your kids up or go to school plays or having more holiday days or you know things like that so it's not a real you know financial driven decision for a lot of people these days so companies can't just you know throw money at you know recruitment they have to be able to offer a lot more in terms of the overall sort of package for individuals as well uh, Is there a sort of a sense of are people going back to the office more now or are they still kind of wanting that hybrid working environment or maybe they just want to work remotely? I mean, yeah, interestingly, I think as a common as if you took a sort of an average, people are settling on hybrid working. There is still some companies that are doing exclusively fully remote. I don't think there's many companies that are doing five days back in the office unless there's a specific you know need for it if you physically need to be in your office to do your job but i think the maximum i'm seeing people going in really is probably three or four days and actually it, it, so in my opinion looking at it and talking to people i think the hybrid model is is 100 the best model because it does two things or it does lots of things first of all it offers that flexibility that people want um it offers people you know the opportunity to both be sociable and be in the office but also you know to have that autonomy to work from home you know and cut out some travel as well um because i think it's i, I think it's really important and i'm not sure you know, i still speak to some people and again coming back to some of the challenges that i face is, is where you get candidates that say you know i only want to work fully remote won't consider anything else and 
I mean, I can't speak for everybody, but I think for the most part, as humans, we, we need that human interaction. I'm not sure working five days a week from home is good, even if maybe you you think personally you're OK with that. And it's good. I think it will have eventually at some point some slightly detrimental effects. So I think the hybrid model works perfectly. I have a lot of friends that work up in the city. It was a big push about a year or so ago to start bringing people back in. I think if I'm honest, it was big corporations that were paying thousands and thousands of pounds a month in rent, kind of wanted to get their money's worth. But there was, there was a big resistance from candidates because everyone kind of realised that they don't need to be there every day. But I think, like I said, what's hand is sort of panned out that they've sort of settled on this sort of two to four days a week in the office hybrid model. Yeah, it's interesting. I've got friends who still work up in London in the city and they um, and I think most of them are on a two straight three day area. They share out the office work, I think, amongst themselves as well. So they might do, you know, a week, a week in, a week out and do it that way. So they keep to that whole kind of flexibility going, which always is kind of interesting. But I do agree. I think there's an areas of social aspects that people will miss out. And I feel quite sorry for the kind of younger generation, um, because having had that culture of office environment and the, the stuff that gets discussed at the you know the traditional water fountain and all that kind of that, that kind of thing it's things like that just very hard to replicate and i think one of the one of the interesting areas that kind of leads to is how does the the talent pool kind of come together because there was always a great deal of referrals and word, word of mouth how does the talent pool come together and how do you reach your talent pool what's your strategy for outreach to those people and how do you stay put your business in front of those guys and say that you know we're here to help so interestingly now in some ways it's easier to contact them because often they're from home you know so i remember before you know if i was to phone people 99 percent of the time they're in the office right so it's difficult to take a call from a recruiter while you're in the office so actually in some ways that's one of the things that has helped you know or you might i might speak to someone they say i can't talk today because i'm in the office but i'm working from home tomorrow or i'll speak to you then so actually it, it, it allows us me to have more conversations with people and again you know if i email them as well you know they might have their private email open on a separate window but you wouldn't maybe necessarily have that open if you were in the office so actually in some ways it's become slightly easier to communicate with candidates i think the opposite is true with clients because where you could just phone up the general switchboard and maybe sometimes they'll put you through there's difficult now because there's no general switchboard for people working from home but but definitely from a candidate perspective i think it's helped um you know be able to communicate with them a bit better because they're a bit more open and free to communicate one of the things that we try to do at the weave is create events open innovation events bringing people together hackathons or iTunes programs or things along those lines and I think sometimes I, I look at it from that perspective when you bring these younger people together in that environment that's almost like bringing a talent pool of technicians and people coming together to work in that particular space and it's almost quite nice from a recruiter's perspective I would imagine if you got involved in things like that sometimes to see these kind of people working um, in teams in that area and there might be as a kind of a recruitment tool it opens up some additional avenues of of evaluation are people becoming more creative about the way that they outreach for these people and what they do and to test out and to evaluate the candidates in different ways I think the interview process itself hasn't changed a lot actually that's the one thing that's remained fairly consistent I mean I tend to work with smaller startup SME type businesses um, but I do know some of the bigger companies, my previous career with Hayes, Hayes being one of the sort of big four international recruitment companies, they used to do a lot of these networking social events, but also some of the bigger clients. These are more sort of corporate, sort of, you know, larger clients. They used to run workshops and, you know, run these external events and stuff like that. Um, but they were doing, I think that tended to work quite well for if you're doing sort of graduate recruitment or it's an intake of quite a lot of jobs but some of the smaller businesses i work with yeah i think that the recruitment process for the most part has sort of stayed the same the biggest difference actually for the interview process now is often their teams calls or video yeah. calls as opposed to face to face or certainly for a first stage anyway um but yeah i haven't really yeah i haven't heard much about people hiring from events and stuff
when you were talking about the interview process being online and things like that, I always remember that, I mean, quite clearly when I was interviewing people for roles and things, it was a very face-to-face environment and you picked up on their body language and, and the way they were. Presumably, therefore, there, there must be greater challenges in some respects for people's personalities to come out across the screens and the way they're communicating. When you speak to candidates, do, do, do you prepare them in any different ways now in their recruitment process? than maybe than what they you might have been done when it was more of a face-to-face thing yeah i mean so i agree completely i think um face-to-face is is always always better you know you just pick on pick up on different things and like you know for instance sometimes you know technology is great but you know sometimes there's a slight delay or it freezes and you know when you sort of mid-flow of a conversation or you're in the middle of something it's quite disruptive and stuff so i think i wouldn't say it's difficult but it's it's slightly harder maybe to bring out your best side or your best personality you know on a video call a lot of communication with humans is non-verbal Right. So, for instance, I look at you here, I can only really see a third of your body. So I potentially miss out on a third of the things that you're trying to say to me non-verbally. So I think, you know, with some of these people, I mean, I spoke to a candidate I placed about eight months ago and it was a fully remote role. Uh, He had three interviews. They were all teams calls. And about eight months into the role, we had never met anyone, never met anyone. You know, I think that's crazy. You know, I know sometimes, you know, organisations have an annual thing or a biannually thing. But yeah, I don't know. It was this guy had been working for a company for eight months and he hadn't met anyone at all in person, not for the interview or anything. But in terms of the preparation, not really. I still kind of say the same things because the same things are still relevant. The only slight bit of advice I give him now is more from a technical perspective, which is log on 10 minutes before, make sure everything's working, make sure you've got the latest version of whatever video software you're using, make sure you're somewhere quiet, power, stuff like that, and your camera's working. So yeah, that's the main difference between the, uh, the, the sort of interview prep these days. Thinking about maybe some ways in the future, I know AI is a big influence or could be a big influence in the world of recruitment. Are you seeing changes in the way people potentially market themselves? Are they using different technologies to get in front of companies or along those lines? Or do you think that AI has yet to really spark a lot of kind of creativity in the way people are engaging with recruitment? I think you said at the beginning of our conversation is took two decades worth of experience. It was 2001 I started. I am still a bit old school. I am still traditional. I do still like to talk to people, meet people, phone people up. So I am a bit old school in that sense. I just think recruitment and life in general, right, is just about relationships. Absolutely. So I, I'm a little bit behind the curve with AI and um, and whatnot, but um I've, I've seen it creeping in a little bit, just naturally. So one of the things from a candidate perspective I've seen is I get AI generated responses. So I do a lot of work on LinkedIn. And actually, I've noticed over the last probably six months that LinkedIn actually are trying to push their AI tools more and more. So I saw something a couple of days ago that was as I was doing a search. So I was looking for candidates. It kept asking me, do I want to use its new AI search tool that would do the search for me or help prompt with bits and pieces? And that's both a, a type sort of a text based thing, but also um, there was a speech product on there as well where you could physically speak and talk what you're looking for. So there's lots of these sort of AI add-ons coming in. But from a candidate perspective, I think, like I said, I've seen a lot of AI generated responses which I'm not a big fan of for two reasons. One, because you can clearly tell they're AI generated and often they don't quite make sense. They make sense grammatically, but not for the for the reply, what a reply should be like. That's the first thing. The second thing is, I don't know, again, it, maybe it's just me, but I think it feels like it's lazy, right? How much do you really want that job if you're just clicking a button as opposed to physically being, like, I really want this job. I'm going to write a proper reply. So there is that to it. And then again, I'm, I'm sure there's sort of applications that I don't know about the AI generated job search tools, add-ons, plugins that you just tell the computer what you're looking for. And, you know, AI will go and find you and possibly apply directly for those jobs. I'm sure that's happening. I mean, I don't 
do loads in terms of actual advertising. So there's certain job boards and platforms where you can advertise your roles. And I think there's a lot of tools that AI tools that kind of scrape those and get the information off of those and feed it back to candidates for job applications and things. I tend just to work within my own network. I tend to not really necessarily need to advertise. So I haven't had much experience of that. But that's from a sort of a, a candidate perspective. I, I feel like there is definitely tools out there. But I think I read it. I read a stat somewhere that within the next year, almost every application that we use will have an AI add-on. It's inevitable, really. You know, with some jobs, I think there's always an element of just that human interaction will always give you the edge, right? And I do think recruitment is one of those because it's a, fundamentally, it's a people-driven business. Uh, so I think AI and machine learning and algorithms can take you so far. So I think the landscape of how we recruit and how people job search will change, definitely. And I think probably like with most things, with computers, things tend to get better. And that's normally probably from a speed perspective. So it will allow you to find cash that it's quicker it will allow you to find jobs quicker certainly there'll be a place for people like me within the process as well who do you want to work with who, who's your ideal kind of customers the easiest way to describe it is, is i want to work with people who i would want to work for so really they are sort of kind of startups innovative tech companies smes people that are doing good interesting things but also as well for me i really want to deal with sort of managing directors CEOs, the people that run the businesses, the people that make the decisions, the directors, um, you know, these are the people that have a direct influence in how, when, why they recruit. Um, so that's sort of the level that I like, you know, from a um, relationship perspective. But yeah, the cyber companies, again, like I said, sort of tech company, people that are doing really interesting, cool things, people that are doing good causes, um, anywhere from, you know, startups up to probably three, four hundred people plus. That's probably my sweet point. And what about candidates? How do you get hold of them and, and how can they reach out to you? But 99% of my communication is either done with my existing networks. So obviously, we have each other's contact details already. Um, outside of that, LinkedIn, probably 90% of my time and communication is spent on LinkedIn. So, yeah, look me up on LinkedIn if anyone wants to get in touch. OK, all right. Just um, some rapid, quick fire questions. The last movie that you really enjoyed or TV series? TV series, Once the Queen's Gambit, which I absolutely love, completely got addicted to and binge watched it in like three nights. The second one is because I'm a bit of a sucker for stories. I've really, really liked Welcome to Wrexham. Just the way they done it, the way they got involved in the community and the team and the town. So, yeah, so th those two probably are the things that I've, uh, I've enjoyed watching the most. Favourite meal on your birthday? I always get a lot of grief for this, but it's my mum's spaghetti because it, it sounds disgusting, but it, it, it's spaghetti bolognese. But it's literally just minced fried onions and then a tin of tomato soup with spaghetti. <laughs> and I used to have it uh, as a kid all the time. And then I remember I used to always request it on my birthday. And I, I'm 45 now. and I think I got to about early 30s of still having it like every birthday. And then my wife sort of was like, you can't keep eating that. So, yeah, I have had it for a while. But that's, that's probably the dinner that I would probably always want. What a great way to end the conversation there with Paul reminiscing about his favourite meal. We had some great points raised during that conversation, especially around the way people have changed the way in which they're working by spending less time in an office. But I was also pleased to hear that people are looking for more jobs that don't simply offer more money, but more value and meaning to their lives. As someone who has been an environmental campaigner for many years, to hear that people are shifting to working for organisations that share their core values is really great to hear. Just a quick mention if you want to be on the podcast and tell people of our region about your business, if you want to have a community that supports you, and if you want a place to learn and develop as a business owner, then simply join our free community by visiting weartheweave.co.uk. I've been Adam Roxby, Director of Communications, and I look forward to seeing you, as always, in the community. Music